great to see you. I want to tell you a story. I have the paper here in case I forget how it goes, because I haven't told it for a while, but I think I'll remember, but I'm ready to peek if I have to. It's called the best meal, but it could also be called the Sabbath meal. Do you know what Sabbath is? Sabbath is the day of the week that is set aside to be a day of rest. And it used to be something that people took very seriously in our culture and not so much anymore. For Christians, the Sabbath was Sunday. For Jews, it would start at sundown on Friday and go till sundown on Saturday. And people didn't work during that time. Well, you know things are a little different now. But this is a story called The Best Meal. And it's about a chef. A chef is someone who cooks fancy meals. She was a really, really great chef. And she loved to prepare very fancy meals. And she loved to teach other people how to make the wonderful dishes that she loved to make. And then she would throw these big fancy parties. And everybody would come and eat all of this special food. And all you could hear would be people chewing and going, mmm, ooh, oh, that's so delicious. Now, of course, every time she threw a party, and she did this every month, she wanted new things for people to try, right? So she had to do a lot of traveling to discover new recipes and new dishes. And she would go all over the land visiting different places. And when people knew she was coming, they would get very excited and they'd give her a big welcome. And all the best cooks in town would bring out their best recipes and hope that there would be things she liked enough to go back and use in her hometown. So once she had been, so you can imagine, she ate a lot of different kinds of food and she loved trying different things. Well, she was on her way home from one of these trips, and she decided that instead of continuing traveling, she was going to stop and have dinner and rest for the night and finish going home in the morning. So she stopped at a little farmhouse in the country to ask directions to the nearest hotel. But the woman who lived there immediately said, no, 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 you can stay with us. And she invited the chef to come in, and they were just about to have dinner. So the chef got to eat with the family. So mother was taking the casserole out of the oven, and brother was finishing chopping up the vegetables and tossing them with dressing for a salad, and sister was slicing the bread, and the chef wanted to help too, so she set the table. And they all sat down together to eat. But before they eat, ate, they all took hands around the table. The chef felt the sister take her hand on the one side, so she reached out and took the brother's hand on the other side. And while they were holding hands, the mother said, To have food on the table, and the children replied, is a blessing. And then the mother said, to see the sun set and know the sun will rise again in the morning, and the children said, is a blessing. And then the mother said, the love of family and the warmth of friendship and the grace of the spirit, and the children replied, is a blessing. And that time the chef joined in too, and everyone laughed because they were so happy she had joined them in saying grace. And then during the meal, they shared stories about their day, and they laughed together, and the food was the most delicious that the chef had ever tasted. And after the children went to bed, she said to the mother, I have got to have your recipes to take home and use. Well, the mother was very honored. She knew who this was by now. And she had just served this, what she thought was a very simple meal. But she was happy to give the chef her recipes, and she did. And the next day, the chef went on her way, and she immediately began preparations for her next dinner. She called her student chefs together, and she said, these are the new recipes. I want you to make them perfectly. She invited all of her fanciest friends to come to this wonderful dinner. She thought it was going to be so perfect. The chefs worked hard to get it exactly right. They served the meal, and it didn't taste the same. It wasn't as good. And the chef was very upset. First, she called her students together, and she said, what did you do wrong? And they insisted that she had made, they had made the recipes exactly the way they were written down. So then the chef had people go and get the mother and bring her to the house. And she said to the mother, what did you leave out? What did you leave out of these recipes? Because something's missing. It didn't taste the same. The mother looked puzzled at first, and then she started to laugh. She said, oh, I know what the problem is. But what's missing isn't something you can put in a recipe. She looked at the chef and said, did you all work together to make the meal? Did you hold hands around the table and give thanks together before you ate it? And while you ate it, did you tell stories about your day and share your lives with each other? Well, no, said the chef. None of those things happened. 
And then she began to understand that sharing a meal together, breaking bread together, isn't special because you have the best food or the fanciest food. It's special because you do it together and you do it with love. And so after that, she started throwing a very different kind of dinner party. She had smaller parties. They were much less formal. And everyone came early and worked together with her and the chefs to make the meals together. And then they would hold hands around the table and give thanks and share stories while they ate. And after that, every meal was the best meal. So thank you all for listening. I'd tell you what the point is, but I think you got it already. <laughs> and I think we sing to you as you go off for classes, right? Bill and I just had a little altercation about whose turn it was. <laughs> and I, I actually... Hmm? <laughs> I had a moment sitting there of thinking I had neglected to print the page that had the readings and I was going to have to pull out my phone and find the Google Doc, but this will not be necessary. I have two readings I'd like to share this morning. One comes from Wayne Muller's little book, Sabbath, Finding Rest, Renewal, and Delight in Our Busy Lives. He writes, in Sabbath time, we remember to celebrate what is beautiful and sacred. We light candles, sing songs, tell stories, eat, nap, make love. It is a time to let our work, our lands, our animals lie fallow, to be nourished and refreshed. Within this sanctuary, we become available to the insights and blessings of deep mindfulness that only arise in stillness and time. When we act from a place of deep rest, we are more capable of cultivating what the Buddhists would call right understanding, right action, and right effort. In a complex world and unstable world, if we do not rest, if we do not surrender into some kind of Sabbath, how can we find our way? How will we hear the voices that tell us the right thing to do? The second reading comes from Barbara Brown Taylor, and I had it written on an index card, and then when I went to try to figure out where it had come from originally, I couldn't pin down the source. But she's an Episcopal priest who has written widely on religious questions, and I love her because the tagline on her website is, I say things I'm not supposed to. So I recommend her highly. She writes, at least one day in every seven, pull off the road, and park the car in the garage. Close the door to the tool shed. Turn off the computer. Stay home, not because you are sick, but because you are well. Talk someone you love into being well with you. Take a nap, a walk, an hour for lunch. Test the premise that you are worth more than you can produce. That even if you spent one whole day of being good for nothing, you would still be precious in God's sight. And when you get anxious because you are convinced that this is not so, remember that your own conviction is not required. This is a commandment. Your worth has already been established, even when you are not working. The purpose of the commandment is to woo you to the same truth. As you probably know from the movie, if not from your own religious upbringing, there are these 10 teachings in the book of Exodus that have come to be known as the 10 commandments. They are without doubt among the most universally accepted codes of behavior in our culture. And most people, even if they don't succeed perfectly in following them, think that for the most part, they make sense. They make sense because they are designed to strengthen the fabric of a community, to protect relationships, and to allow people to live well together. Now, most of them, of course, are about all of the things that we must not do. The shalt nots. And three of those are specifically about our attitude toward God. We're forbidden to have any God other than God. 
a rejection of all the different tribal gods of the time. We're forbidden to make idols, to worship anything that isn't God. And we're forbidden to make wrongful use of the name of God. In other words, God is serious business. Now, many of us don't even believe in God anymore, or at least not in God in the way that God was understood in the Hebrew scriptures. But in that time and culture, their relatively new way of understanding this monotheistic idea of God was the glue that held them together as a people. It was of utmost importance to the cohesion of their community. And so these commandments were very important. And with a certain amount of humanistic translation, they still make sense. Don't assign primary importance to things that aren't of primary importance. Be careful what you worship, whether it's God or love or money or power. It matters what we put first. Moving on, then, we come to the rest of the shalt nots. And like I said, they basically just make sense. If I murder somebody or commit adultery or lie or steal, all of these things destroy trust within my community. They damage me, and they damage the community within which I live. Even that one about not coveting, that's the hardest one for me. I admit it. I always want what somebody else has. But even that one makes sense, because if we are constantly wanting what someone else has, it corrodes our relationship with that person, and it keeps us perpetually dissatisfied with our own life. So all of these restrictions on behavior are not arbitrary. They're for our own benefit, that we might live well, not just as individuals, but specifically that we might live well together in a healthy community. But along with all these shalt nots come two things that we are expressly commanded to do. We are supposed to honor our parents, and we are supposed to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, I'm not entirely sure why the one about honoring our parents made it into the top ten, although it certainly relates to that idea of community cohesion and sustainability. It can be a very troubling commandment when it's used to justify abusive relationships between parents and children and it would certainly be worthy of a sermon of its own. But that's not this morning. This morning, I want to stay with that other positive commandment about remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy. With only ten things considered important enough to make it into the Decalogue, I find it astonishing that one of them is about resting. And it's the only one that no one seems to take seriously. We live in a culture that gives a lot of lip service to the Ten Commandments. And most people I know, even if they are not Jewish or Christian in their background, think that they at least ought to obey nine out of the ten, even if they don't do it perfectly. And they feel a certain sense of guilt if they break one of those nine commandments. But I don't know anybody who really believes that it's equally important to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, we Unitarian Universalists place a very high value on freedom. We want to make our own choices, thank you very much. We've rejected a lot of theology over the years, and we've also rejected a lot of the structure and formation of traditional religion. We've let go of many religious ideas, either because we found them unbelievable or because we found them inconvenient. Now, I celebrate this freedom I was raised in it. I'm grateful for a faith that allows me to follow my heart and my conscience, to make my own decisions. And I also believe that some of the forms and concepts and even restrictions of our religious past could be useful to us and that it might be time to consider reclaiming them. Now, some of you are old enough, like me, to remember a time when Sunday was quieter than the rest of the week. Who can remember those days? It was really different, right? I inherited a set of building blocks, these lovely walnut building blocks that had been my father's when he was a child. We called them the Sunday blocks. Dad was born in 1923, and in his youth, those blocks were saved as a special treat for Sunday afternoon when rowdier activities were frowned upon. I grew up in a liberal humanist Unitarian household in the 1960s, 
So honoring the Sabbath really wasn't part of my frame of reference. Except. Except that we always went to church. Okay, we always went to our little lay-led humanist UU fellowship meeting at the local YWCA, which was not exactly church. But we went as religiously as my Catholic friends went to Mass. We didn't go to the mall or even the grocery store because we couldn't. My dad actually stayed home in the afternoon on Sundays and read the paper instead of spending the day at his office. Now, the word for holy in the ancient Hebrew is kadesh, which means set apart, other, different, with the implication that this difference is of a special and positive nature. The Sabbath was supposed to be a day set apart, treated differently than the other days. And in our odd, humanist New York Times reading way, our family observed it, in part because so much of the world simply stopped that there weren't that many other options. I remember when various commercial establishments began to open on Sunday. The supermarket, the mall. I thought it was great. My mother didn't. And I was surprised because she was a you know, good liberal. She should believe in greater choice, greater opportunity for everybody, right? But her point was that the people who worked in those businesses often didn't get a choice. And if stores were open on Sunday, then somebody had to be working. And that meant that a whole group of people automatically lost the guaranteed opportunity for a day of rest. For us, we could choose whether to go to the store or not. For them, it was not a choice. And in its original context, this commandment to remember the Sabbath was definitely, at least partly, a matter of justice. If you read the full text, it says that everyone in the household shall rest on the Sabbath including servants and slaves and even livestock. Everyone got a day of rest, including and maybe especially the people who needed it the most. Now, of course, in a culture that allows for religious freedom, a state-mandated Sabbath is inappropriate, if only because different faiths keep their Sabbath at different times. But still, we lost something with the loss of the blue laws. We lost an enforced day of rest that was available to almost everyone. Keeping the Sabbath is about resting from our labors, but it's really about more than that. Now, we know that our bodies need a rhythm of rest and activity in order to be healthy. We even know there have been plenty of studies that show that productivity goes up when people take time for rest and refreshment. You know, studies that show that businesses who give their workers a two-hour lunch break and encourage them to nap during one of them show dramatically higher productivity in the afternoon than companies who don't. So we could argue that building Sabbath time into our lives actually makes us more productive. It's almost certainly true, and if that helps you justify taking a little Sabbath time in this culture that makes it so hard to stop producing, then use that argument by all means. But resting in order to produce productivity is not the point of Sabbath. In his book, The Sabbath, from 1951, Abraham Joshua Heschel reminds us, the Sabbath as a day of rest is not for the purpose of recovering one's lost strength and becoming fit for the forthcoming labor. The Sabbath is a day for the sake of life. In the book that I quoted, for one of our readings this morning. Wayne Muller reminds us, Sabbath is more than the absence of work. It is the presence of something that arises when we consecrate a period of time to listen to what is most deeply beautiful, nourishing, or true. It is a time consecrated with our attention, our mindfulness, honoring those quiet forces of grace or spirit that sustain and heal us. And he argues that the reason we are commanded to remember the Sabbath is that it's so easy to forget that this is important. We don't need to be told to remember the other commandments. We're not likely, whether we follow them or not, we're not likely to forget that it is destructive to murder and to lie and to steal and to covet. 
But we may forget that it's equally destructive to be so immersed in the call to work and be productive that we fail to honor what Muller calls those quiet forces of grace or spirit that sustain and heal us. We may all understand those forces differently. We may not all talk about them in religious language, but I think most of us have an intuitive understanding of what they are for us, what it is that sustains and heals us and allows us to live fuller lives. Now, we don't like commandments. We joke in our denomination about the 10 suggestions. But one important role of religion is to provide structures that help us do what we know is good for us, but that is hard for us to do on our own. If we reject the structures, then sometimes we also lose the support for doing something that we really need. When we're surrounded by the possibility for stimulation all the time, and we are, I heard a cell phone go off earlier, we, and I have, I have preached watching people post what I'm saying to Facebook. Some, some of my colleagues encourage that. I'd rather you listen first and type later, but, you know, do what you need to do. But my point is that 24-7, we have the opportunity to be connected. Most of us carry the entire world in our pocket or purse all the time. And when we're, when we're surrounded by that possibility all the time, it's really hard not to keep buying into it. We argue for the advantage of having more choices, but then we don't always choose what's going to be good for us. One of my most vivid experiences of Sabbath time came during my final spring when I was here with you all at UUFLB. I was working half-time as your minister, and I was also, just for a sense of balance in my life and to help me keep my boundaries, I was working half-time at a warehouse, packing garden supplies to be shipped to retail customers. I actually really enjoyed it. I worked there two or three days a week from 7 to 3, and from noon to 12.30 every day, Everything stopped for lunch break. And for that half hour, there was nothing else in the world I was supposed to be doing but sitting on the grass eating my peanut butter sandwich. I would watch the clouds, listen to the birds, and let my mind wander. And those were some of the happiest moments of that entire year. The saving grace in a time that was filled with anxiety and stress in both my family and my ministry. I had realized at that point with great pain that I could not continue in the role of a parish minister and was struggling with how to move forward with that. My parents had begun to decline, and I was struggling to figure out what they needed and how I was going to help them get it. My emotions were at the breaking point. I was anxious all the time. I lost about 10 pounds, and I wasn't sleeping. But during those lunch breaks, everything went quiet. Theoretically, there's no reason in the world why I couldn't have taken a half an hour out of my time when I was here at church or when I was at home, but I didn't. But at the warehouse, because everything stopped, I stopped too. Because no one expected us to do anything but rest during that half hour. And it became holy time. Now, Muller suggests that we think of this commandment to rest as a gift not as a restriction. He tells this wonderful story of planting tulip bulbs. He had seen a display in a gardening magazine of just this riot of color of all these different tulip bulbs, and he decided, I want that in my garden. So he ordered all these bulbs, and he planted them, and they got about this high, and the deer ate them down to the ground. And he did it the next year, and the same thing happened. And finally, even though he hated fences, he built a fence around his garden and for the first time, the tulips grew tall enough to bloom, and he was able to experience that glorious riot of color in his garden. And then, of course, because he's a preacher, he has to draw a parallel between this and life, because that's what we do. And he acknowledged that we have come to expect these limitless choices. We don't want anything fencing us in or closing us off from anything else. We resent prohibitions and restrictions, but he asked, what if we hear those prohibitions with different ears? What if, like the fence around my tulips, these teachings are not the punitive restrictions of a grumpy, humorless parent, but rather a useful boundary that keeps out those things that would bring us harm? Time and again in spiritual practice, we are asked to imagine that certain limitations on our choices 
are actually seeds of greater freedom. I want to repeat that last line. Certain limitations on our choices are actually seeds of greater freedom. We no longer feel bound by the ancient commandments. And yet, in the course of writing this sermon, I came to believe that remembering the Sabbath is as necessary to the well-being of people and their communities as any of those other rules that govern our interactions and keep us healthy. Our culture no longer imposes these restrictions on us. So we have to choose from among our limitless choices to restrict ourselves, to restrict our choices. Now, we're so aware of how much work needs to be done in this world of ours that it may feel self-indulgent to take quiet time when we could be reading or protesting or marching or writing letters. And that's precisely why we need to hear the commandment to remember the Sabbath as a commandment and not just a suggestion. Because like the other commandments, it is necessary for the healthy survival of a community. I remind you of Wayne Muller's words. When we act from a place of deep rest, we are more capable of cultivating what the Buddhists would call right understanding, right action, and right effort. In a complex and unstable world, I think ours qualifies. If we do not rest, if we do not surrender into some kind of Sabbath, how can we find our way? How can we hear the voices that tell us the right thing to do. Our world needs now more than ever that we listen for those voices, that we discern carefully and mindfully. So I invite you to accept a Sabbath challenge. Find a small way to build into your life a little time, as Muller puts it, that is consecrated with your attention, your mindfulness, honoring those quiet forces of grace or spirit that heal and sustain you. Listen for those voices that tell us the right thing to do. Now, he suggests all kinds of little exercises you could use for the cultivation of some Sabbath mental space that can be done even in little bits and pieces, like my little half-hour lunch break. You could choose one cue that you encounter regularly throughout the day. It could be every time you approach a traffic light every time the phone rings, every time you reach for a doorknob. doesn't matter what, as long as it's something that will happen more than once. And use that as a Sabbath pause. Each time you encounter it, just stop and take three mindful breaths before you go on. Or set aside one meal each week that you prepare the way our chef learned to prepare in the story this morning paying careful attention to the ingredients, preparing with a sense of gratitude, turn your phone off as you prepare it, set the table nicely, add a vase of flowers. You can do it alone or you can share the time with someone you love. As our story reminds us, that kind of mindful preparation and then the sharing of the meal makes things so much more delicious. Or set aside a time each day where you just sit and light a candle and take a few meditative breaths. It doesn't have to be long. Or set aside a part of each day when you don't check your email or your text messages. Or I've had friends have entire days that were technology-free. Depending on what you do during the course of your life, not all of us can get away with that for a day. May our small, subversive Sabbath actions lead us to deeper internal peace and a clearer sense of right understanding, right action, and right effort. For your own well-being and for the well-being of your communities, I encourage you, now I'm going to go a step further, I command you to find your own way to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy.